of York and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, cheated a feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why? I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. Dive thoughts down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. Brother, good day. <coughs> What means this armored guard that waits upon your grace? His majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. Well, alack, <laughs> my lord, that fault is none of yours, for that he should commit your godfather. Belike his majesty hath some intent that you should be new christened in the tower. But. What's the matter, Clarence? May I know? Yea, Richard, when I know, for I protest as yet I do not, 
But as I can learn, he hearkens after dreams and prophecies and from the cross row plucks the letter G and says, a wizard told him that by G his issue disinherited should be. And for my name of George begins with G, it follows to his thought that I am he. These, as I learn, and such like toys as these, have moved his highness to commit me now. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. Tis not the king that sends you to the tower. My lady Grey, his wife, Clarence, tis she that tempts him to this harsh extremity. Was it not she and that good man of worship, Anthony Woodville, her brother there, who made him send Lord Hastings to the tower, from whence this present day he is delivered. We are not safe, Clarence. We are not safe. By heaven, I think no man is secure, but the queen's kindred and night-walking heralds that trudge betwixt the king and mistress shore. Heard ye not what a humble supplicant Lord Hastings was for his delivery? Humbly complaining to her deity got my Lord Chamberlain his liberty. I'll tell you what. I think it is our way, if we will keep in favor with the king, to be her men and wear her livery. <laughs> I beseech your graces both to pardon me. His majesty has straightly given in charge that no man shall have private conference of what degree soever with your brother. Even so. But to please your worship, Ratcliffe, you may partake of anything we say. We speak no treason, man. We say the king is wise and virtuous, and his noble queen well struck in years, fair and not jealous, and that the queen's kin are made gentle folks. How say you, sir? Can you deny all this? I beseech your grace to pardon me, and do withal, forbear your conference with the noble duke. We know thy charge, and will obey. We are the queen's abjects, and must obey. Brother. Oh, well, I will unto the king, and whatsoe'er you will employ me in, I will perform it to enfranchise you. Meantime, this deep disgrace in brotherhood touches me dearer than you can imagine. I know it pleaseth neither of us well. Well, your imprisonment will not be long. I will deliver you or lie for you. Meantime, I must, for course. Farewell. Go, tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return. Simple, plain Clarence, I do love thee so that I will shortly send thy soul to heaven, if heaven will take the present at our hands. <laughs> But who comes here, the new delivered Hastings? Good time of day unto my gracious lord. As much unto my good lord Chamberlain, well are you welcome to the open air. How hath your lordship brooked in prison? With patience, noble lord, as prisoners must. But I shall live, my lord, to give them thanks to well the cause of my imprisonment. No doubt, no doubt, and so shall Clarence too, for they that were your enemies are his, and have right. prevailed as much on him as you. What news abroad? No news as bad abroad as this at home. The king is sickly, weak, and melancholy, and his physicians fear him mightily. Now by St. Paul, that news is bad indeed. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long, and overmuch consumed his royal person is very grievous to be thought upon. Where is he in his bed? There he is. Go you before and I will follow you. He cannot live, I hope, and must not die till George be packed with post haste up to heaven. I'll in to urge his hatred more toward Clarence with lies well steeled with weighty arguments. And if I fail not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live. Which done, God take King Edward to his mercy and leave the world for me to bustle in. For then I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What though I killed her husband and her father? The readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. But yet I run before my horse to market. Clarence still breathes, 
Edward still lives and reigns, when they are gone, then must I count my gain. that makes us wretched by the death of thee that I can wish to wolves, to spiders, toads, or any creeping them in thing that lives. If ever he have child, abortive be it. If ever he have wife, let her be made more miserable by the death of him than I am made by my young lord in thee. Come now towards Chelsea with your holy load, taken from Paul's to be interred there. Stay, you that bear the corpse and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? Villain, set down the corpse, or by St. Paul, I'll make a corpse of him that disobeys. What do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. Avant, thou dreadful minster of hell. Thou hast but power over his mortal body, his soul thou canst not have, therefore be gone. Sweet saint, for charity be not so cursed. Thou devil, for God's sake, hence and trouble us not, for thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. Lady, you know no rules of charity, which <coughs> renders good for bad, blessings for persons. Villain, thou knowest no law of God nor man, no beast so fierce, but know some touch of pity. But I know none, and therefore am no beast. How wonderful when devils tell the truth. More wonderful when angels are so angry. Vouchsafe, divine, perfection of a woman, of these supposed crimes, but by leave to give me circumstance to acquit myself. Vouchsafe, diffuse, infection of a man, of these known evils, but to give me leave by circumstance to accuse thy cursed self. Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Valor than heart can think thee, thou canst make no excuse parent but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing shalt thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself, the dis unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not. Then they were not slain, but dead they are, and devilish slave by thee. I did not kill your husband. Why, then he is alive. Nay, he is dead and slain by Edward's hand. In thy foul throat thou liest. Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant you. Dost grant me, Hedgehog. Then God grant me too. Thou mayest be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle and mild and virtuous. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that halt to send him <sighs> thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. <laughs> Ill respite the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you. I hope so. I know so. But, gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall something into a slower method is not the causer of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner. Thou was the cause of that accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty that did haunt me in my dreams to undertake the death of all the world so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. If I thought that, I tell thee, homicide, these nails should rend that beauty from my cheek. These eyes could not endure sweet beauty's wreck. You should not blemish it if I stood by. 
as all the world is cheered by the sun, so I buy that. It is my day, my life. Black night or shade thy day, and death thy life. Curse not thyself, fair creature, thou art both. I would I were to be revenged on thee. It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth thee. It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that killed my husband. He that bereft thee of thy husband, lady, did it to help thee to a better husband. His better doth not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves you better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The self-same name, but one of better name. Where is he? Here. <coughs> Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake? Never pin poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fowler toad. <laughs> Out of my sight! Thou dost infect mine eyes! Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine! Would they were basilics to strike thee dead! I would they were, that I might die at once! For now they kill me with a living death. Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt tears. Shame their aspects a store of childish drops. I never sued to friend nor enemy. My tongue could never learn sweet smoothing word. But now thy beauty is proposed my fee. My proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Teach not thy lips such scorn. For it was made for kissing, lady, not for such contempt. If thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, here, I lend thee this sharp-pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true breast and let the soul forth that adoreth thee, I lay it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg the death upon my knee. Nay, do not pause. I did kill King Henry, but it was thy beauty that provoked me. Nay, now dispatch, twas I stabbed young Edward, but <laughs> was thy heavenly face that set me on. Take up the sword again, or take up me. Arise, dissembler. <laughs> Though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. That was in thy rage. Speak it again. <laughs> and even with the word, this hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shall. For thy love kill a far truer love, to both their deaths shalt thou be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. Disfigured in my tongue. I fear me both are false. Then never man was true. Well, I have put up your sword. Say then, my peace is made. That shalt thou know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. Vouchsafe to wear this ring. To take is not to give. Look how my ring encompasseth thy finger, even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Wear both of them, for both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favor at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. What is it? That it may please you. Leave these sad designs to him that hath most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby House, where, after I have solemnly interred at Jersey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you, for divers unknown reasons. I beseech you grant me this boon with all my heart. And much it joys me too that you are become so penitent. Good father, go along with me. Bid me farewell. Tis more than you deserve. But since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. <coughs> so. 
sirs, take up the corpse. Towards Chertsey, noble lord? No, to Blackfriars. There attend my company. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. What, I that killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremest hate with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and yet to win her, all the world to nothing! Ha! Hath she forgot already that brave prince, Edward, her lord, whom I, some three months since, stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury? A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman this spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet abase her eyes on me, on me, that halts and the misshapen thus? My dukedom to a beggarly denier, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. <coughs> Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass that I may see my shadow as I pass. There's no doubt his majesty will soon recover his accustomed health. In that you brook it ill, it makes him worse. Therefore, for God's sake, entertain good comfort and cheer his grace with quick and gentle eyes. If he were dead, what would betide on me? No other harm but loss of such a lord. The loss of such a lord includes all harms. The heavens have blessed you with a goodly son to be your comforter when he's gone. Ah, he is young. And his minority is put unto the trust of Richard Gloucester, a man that loves not me, nor none of you. Is it concluded he shall be protector? It is determined, not concluded yet. But so it must be if the king miscarry. Here come my lords of Buckingham and Derby. Good time of day unto your royal grace. God make your majesty joyful as you have been. So you the king today, my lord of Derby. Oh, but now the Duke of Buckingham and I are come from, from visiting his majesty. With likelihood of his amendment, Lord. Madam, good hope. His grace speaks cheerfully. God grant him help. Did you confer with him? Aye, madam. He desires to make atonement between the Duke of Gloucester and your brothers, and between them and my Lord Chamberlain, and sent to warn them to his royal presence. When all were well. But that will never be. I fear our happiness is at the height. They do me wrong, and I will not endure it. Who are they that complain unto the king that I, forsooth, am stern and love them not? By holy Paul, they love his grace but lightly that fill his ears with such dissentious rumors. Because I cannot flatter and look fair, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but thus his simple truth must be abused with silken, sly, insinuating jacks. To whom in all this presence speaks your grace? To thee, that hast nor honesty nor grace. When have I injured thee? When done thee wrong, or thee, or thee, or any of your faction, a plague upon you all, his royal grace, whom God preserve better than you would wish, cannot be quiet, scarce a breathing while, that you must trouble him with lewd complaints. Brother of Gloucester, you mistake the matter. The king on his own royal disposition, and not provoked by any suitor else, aiming belike at your interior hatred that in your outward actions shows itself against my children, brothers, and myself. Makes him to send that he may learn the ground of your ill will and thereby to remove it. I cannot tell. The world is grown so bad that wrens make prey where eagles dare not perch. Since every jack became a gentleman, 
There's many a gentle person made a jack. Come, come, we know your meaning, brother Gloucester. You envy my advancement and my friends. God grant we never may have need of you. Meantime, God grants that I have need of you. Our brother is imprisoned by your means, myself disgraced, and the nobility held in contempt, while great promotions are daily given to ennoble those who scarce some two days since were worth a noble. By him that raised me to this careful height from that contented half which I enjoyed, I never did incense his majesty against the Duke of Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. My lord, you do me shameful injury falsely to draw me in these vile suspects. You may deny that you were not the mean of my lord Hastings' late imprisonment. She may, my lord, for she was a... She lady. may, Lord Rivers. Why, who knows not so? She may do more, sir, than denying that. She may help you to many fair preferments, and then deny her aiding hand therein, and lay those honors on your high desert. My lord of Gloucester, too long have I borne your blunt upbraidings and your bitter scoffs. By heaven, I will acquaint his majesty of those gross taunts that oft I have endured. I'd rather be a country servant maid than a great queen with this condition, to be so baited, scorned, and stormed at. Small joy have I in being England's queen. And lessened be that small god, I beseech him. Thy honor, state, and seat is due to me. What threat you me with telling of the king? Tell him and spare not. Look what I have said. I will have vouched in presence of the king. I dare adventure to be sent to the tower. Tis time to speak. My pains are quite forgot. Out, devil. I remember them too well. Who killed my husband Henry in the tower, and Edward, my poor son at Tewkesbury. Ere you were queen, I, or your husband king, I was a pack horse in his great affairs. To royalize his blood, I spent mine own. Aye, and much better blood than his or thine. In all which time, you and your husband Grey were factious for the house of Lancaster. And Rivers, so were you. Let me remind you, if you forget, what you have been ere this and what you are. With all, what I have been and what I am. Murderous villain, and so still thou art. I would to God my heart were flint like Edward's or Edward soft and pitiful like mine. I am too childish, foolish for this world. Hide thee to hell for shame, and leave this world, thou demon. There thy kingdom is. My lord of Gloucester, in those busy days which here you urge to prove us enemies, we followed then our lord, our sovereign king. So should we you, if you should be our king. If I should be, I had rather be a peddler, Far be it from my heart, the thought thereof. As little joy, my lord, as you suppose you should enjoy, were you this country's king, as little joy may you suppose in me that I enjoy being the queen thereof. I can no longer hold me patient. Hear me, you wrangling pirates that fall out and share ah. that which you have killed from me. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? Ah, gentle villain, do not turn away. Foul wrinkled witch, what makes thou in my sight? But repetition of what thou hast marred, that I will make before I let thee go. A husband and a son thou owest to me, and thou a kingdom, and all of you allegiance. The curse my noble father laid on thee, when thou didst crown his warlike brows with paper, and with thy scorns threwst rivers from his eyes, and then to dry them gave the duke a clout steeped in the faultless blood of pretty Rutland. His curses then, from bitterness of soul denounced against thee, are all fallen upon thee, and God, not we, hath plagued thy bloody deed. So just is God to right the innocent. Oh, was the foulest deed to slay that babe, and the most merciless that was heard of. Tyrants themselves wept when it was reported. No man but prophesied revenge for it. Northumberland, then present, wept to see it. What? Were you snarling all before I came ready to catch each other by the throat and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse so much prevail with heaven that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdoms lost, my woeful banishment should all but answer for this peevish brat? Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why then make way, dull clouds, for my quick curses? Though not by war, by surfeit die your king, as ours by murder to make him a king. 
Edward, thy son that now is Prince of Wales, for Edward, my son that was Prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Long mayst thou live to wail thy children's death. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Rivers and Dorset, you were standers by, and so was thou, Lord Hastings, my poor son was stabbed with bloody daggers. Oh God, I pray that none of you may see his natural age, but by some unlooked accident cut off. Have done thy charm, thou foul, hateful hag! And leave out thee. Stay, dog! <laughs> what thou shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, exceeding those that I can wish for thee, oh, let them keep it till thy sins be ripe, and then rain down their indignation on thee, thou troubler of the world's poor peace. The worm of conscience still be gnaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for enemies whilst thou live, and deepest traitors take for dearest friends. No sleep close up that deadly eye of thine. Unless it be while some tormenting dream affright thee with a hell of ugly devils, thou elvish marked abortive rooting hog, thou that was sealed in thy nativity, the slave of nature and the son of hell, thou... Margaret! Richard! Ha! I call thee not. I do cry thee mercy, then, for I did think that thou hadst called me all these bitter names. Why, so I did, but looked for no reply. Or oh, let me make the period to my curse. Tis done by me and ends in Margaret. Thus have you breathed your curse against yourself. Poor painted queen, vain flourish of my fortune. Why strewest thou sugar on this bottled spider whose deadly web ensnareth thee about? Fool! Fool, thou wetst the night to kill thyself. The day will come when thou shalt wish for me to help thee curse this poisonous bunched back toad. False boding woman, have done thy frantic curse, lest to thy harm thou move our patience. Oh, shame upon you. You have all moved mine. Have done, have done. Oh, princely Buckingham, oh, I'll kiss thy hand in sign of league and amity with thee. Now, fair before thee and thy noble house, thy garments are not spotted with our blood, nor thou within the compass of my curse. Nor no one here, for curses never pass the lips of those that breathe them in the air. I, I will not think, but they ascend the heavens, and there disturb God's gentle sleeping peace. Oh, Father, beware of yonder dog. Look, when he fawns, he bites, and where he bites, his venom tooth will wrangle thee to death. What doth she say, my lord of Buckingham? Nothing that I respect, my gracious lord. What? Dost thou scorn me and my gentle counsel and soothe the devil that I warn thee from? Oh, but remember this another day, when he shall cleave thy very heart with sorrow and say, poor Margaret was a prophetess. Live, each of you, the subject to his hate, and he to yours, and all of you to God's. My hair doth stand on end to hear her curses. So doth mine. I muse why she's at liberty. I cannot blame her by God's holy mother. She hath had too much wrong, and I repent my part thereof that I have done to her. I never did her any to my knowledge. Yet you have all the vantage of her wrong. I was too hot to do somebody good. That is too cold in thinking of it now. Marry, as for Clarence, he is well repaid. He is franked up to fatting for his pains. God pardon them that are any cause thereof. A virtuous and a Christian-like conclusion, to pray for them that have done scathe to us. So do I ever, being well advised. For had I cursed now, I had cursed myself. Madam. His Majesty doth call for you, and for your grace, and for you, my uh, gracious lords. Grace be I come, my lord. Will you go with me? We wait upon your grace. I do the wrong, and first begin to brawl. The secret mischiefs that I set abroach, I lay under the grievous charge of others. Clarence, whom I indeed have cast in darkness, I do beweep to many simple gulls, namely to Darby, Hastings, Buckingham, and tell them 
it is the queen and her allies that stir the king against the duke, my brother. Now they believe it, and whip all wet me to be revenged on rivers, Dorset, Grey. But then I sigh, and with a piece of scripture tell them that God bids us do good for evil. And thus I clothe my naked villainy in odd old ends stolen forth of holy writ, and seem a saint when most I play the devil. But soft, here come my executioners. How now, my hardy, stout, resolved mates? Are you now going to dispatch this thing? We are, my lord, and come to have a warrant that we may be admitted where he is. Well, fought upon, I have it about me. When you are done, repair to Crosby Place. But, sirs, be sudden in the execution, with all obdurate. Do not hear him plead, for Clarence is well spoken and perhaps may move your hearts to pity if you mark him. Tut, tut, my lord, we will not stand to prate. Talkers are no good doers. Be assured we go to use our hands and not our tongues. Your eyes drop millstones when fools' eyes fall tears. I like you, lads. About your business straight. Go, go, dispatch. We will, my noble lord. a miserable night, so full of fearful dreams of ugly sights, that as I am a Christian faithful man, I would not spend another such a night, though twere to buy a world of happy days. So full of dismal terror was the time. What was your dream, my lord? I pray you, tell me. Methought I had broken from the tower, and was embarked across to Burgundy, and in my company my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk upon the hatches. There we looked to England, and sighted up a thousand heavy times that during the wars of York and Lancaster had befallen us. As we paced along upon the giddy footing of the hatches, methought the Gloucester stumbled, and falling struck me that sought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main. Oh, Lord, methought. What pain it is to drown! What dreadful noise of waters in my ears! What ugly sights of death within my eyes! Methought I saw a thousand fearful wrecks, ten thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, wedges of gold, great ingots, heaps of pearl, all scattered about the bottom of the sea. Had you such leisure at the time of death to gaze upon these secrets of the deep? Well, methought I had. And often I did strive to yield up the ghost, but still the envious flood stopped in my soul and would not let it forth to find the vast, empty, wandering air, but smothered it in my panting balk, who almost burst to belch it in the sea. Awake you not in this sore agony? No, no. My dream was lengthened after life. Oh. Then began the torment of my soul. I passed, methought, that melancholy flood with the sour ferryman that poets write of into the kingdom of perpetual night. Then came a shadow, like an angel, with bright hair, dabbled in blood, and he shrieked out aloud, Clarence is come, false, fleeting, perjured Clarence. Seize on him, furies, and take him unto torment. With that, methought, a legion of foul fiends environed me and howled in my ears such hideous cries that I, at the very noise, trembling wake, and could not believe but for a season after that I was in hell. Such 
terrible impression made my dream. No marvel, my lord, that it had frightened you. I am the fear of me thinks to hear you tell it. Oh, my lady, I have done these things that now give evidence against my soul for Edward's sake, and see how he requites me. I pray thee, keeper, sit by me a while. My soul is heavy, and I fain would sleep. I will. God give your grace good rest. Sorrow breaks seasons, and the reposing hours make the night morning and the noontide night. Ho! Oh, who's here? What wouldst thou? And how camest thou hither? I would speak with Clarence, and I came hither on my legs. What, so brief? Tis better man than to be tedious. Let us see our commission and talk no more. I, I am in this commanded to deliver the noble Duke of Clarence unto your hands. I know not what is meant hereby, but I am guiltless as to the meaning. There lies the Duke. <laughs> I, I, I will unto the King and signify to him that thus I have resigned unto you my charge. You may, man, to the point of wisdom. Fare you well. <coughs> What, shall I stab him that he sleeps? No, he'll say it to us Tom Carly when he wakes. He will never wake until the great judgment day. Why then he'll say we stabbed him sleeping. Oh. The urging of that word judgment hath bred a kind of remorse in me. What, <coughs> art thou afraid? Not to kill him, having a warrant, but to be damned for killing him from which no warrant can defend me. I thought that has been resolute. So I am, to let him live. I'll back to the Duke of Gloucester and tell him so. Nay, I stay a little, I pray thee. I hope this passion humor of mine will change. It was wont to hold a man, but while one tells twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. How does they feel thyself now? Some certain dregs of conscience are yet within me. Remember our reward when the deed is done. Swoons. He dies. I had forgot the reward. Where's thy conscience now? Oh, in the Duke of Gloucester's purse. When he opens his purse to give us our reward, thy conscience flies out? Tis no matter. Let it fly. There's few or none will entertain it. What if it come to thee again? I'll not meddle with it. It makes a man a coward. A man cannot steal, but it accuseth him. A man cannot swear, but it checks him. A man cannot lie with his neighbor's wife, but it detects him. It's a blushing, bold-faced spirit that mutinies in a man's bosom. It fills a man full of obstacles. It made me once restore a purse of gold that by chance I found. It beggars any man that keeps it. It's turned out of towns and cities for a dangerous thing, and every man that means to live well endeavors to trust to himself and live without it. Swoons! Tis even now at my elbow persuading me not to kill the Duke. Take the devil in thy mind and believe him not. He would insinuate with thee but to make thee sigh. Tut! I am strong framed. He cannot prevail with me. Spoke like a tall man that respects thy reputation. <laughs> Come, shall we fall to work? Take him on the costume with the hilts of thy sword, and throw him in the momsy butt in the next room. Oh, excellent device. And make a sop out of him. <laughs> <laughs> a soft. He wakes. Strike. No! What reason would him? Where art thou, keeper? Give me a cup of wine. You shall have wine enough, my lord. Enough. In God's name, what art thou? A man as you are. Oh, but not as I am royal. Nor you as we are loyal. Thy voice is thunder, but thy looks are humble. My voice is now the king's. My looks, my own! How darkly and how deadly dost thou speak. Your eyes do menace me. Why look you pale? Who sent you hither? Wherefore do you come? To. To, to murder me. Aye. <laughs> you scarcely have the hearts to say it, and therefore cannot have the hearts to do it. Wherein, friends, have I offended you? Offended us, you have not but the king. I shall be reconciled to him again. Never, my lord. Therefore, prepare to die. Are you drawn forth among a world of men to slay the innocent? 
What is my offense? Where is the evidence that doth accuse me? What lawful quest have handed their verdict up under the frowning judge, or who pronounced the bitter sentence of poor Clarence's death? The deed you undertake is damnable. What we will do, we do upon command. And he that hath commanded is our king. Erroneous vassals. The great king of kings hath in the table of his laws commanded that thou shalt do no murder. Will you spurn at his edict and fulfill a man's? Take heed, for he holds vengeance in his hand to hurl upon the heads of those that would break his law. How canst thou urge God's dreadful law to us? when thou hast broken it in such dear degree. Alas, for whose sake did I that ill deed? For Edward, for my brother, for his sake. He sends you not to murder me for this, for in this sin he is as deep as I. Thy brother's love, our duty, and thy faults provoke us hither now to slaughter thee. If you do love my brother, hate not me, for I am his brother and I love him well. If you're hired for me, go back again, and I will send you to my brother Gloucester, <laughs> Who will reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death? You what? are deceived. Your brother Gloucester hates you. Oh, no, he, he loves me and holds me well. Go you to him for me. Aye, so we will. It cannot be. For he bewept my fortune and held me in his arms and swore with sobs that he would labor my delivery. Why, so he does, when he delivers you from this earth's bottoms to the joys of heaven. Make peace with God. For you must die, my lord. Have you that holy feeling in your soul that you would counsel me to make my peace with God? And are you to your own soul so blind that you would war with God by murdering me? Oh, sirs, consider. They that set you on to do this deed will hate you for the deed. What shall we do? Relent and save your soul. Relent? No! Tis cowardly and woman! Look behind you, my lord! Stop oh. that! And then, if all this will not serve, I'll drown thee in the monty butt within. Oh, no. bloody deed and desperately dispatched. How vain like Pilate would I wash my hands of this most heinous guilty murder done. How now? What means thou that thou helps me not? I have in the duke shall know how slack you have been. I would he knew that I had saved his brother. Take thou the gold, and tell him what I say. For I do repent me that the duke is slain. So do not I go, coward as thou art. Well, I'll go hide the body in some hole, till that the duke give order for his burial. And when I have my mead, I will away. This will out, and I must not stay. So, now have I done a good day's work. You peers continue in this United League. I every day expect an embassy from my Redeemer to redeem me hence. And more of peace, my soul shall pass to heaven, now that I have made my friends at peace on earth. Hastings and Rivers, take each other's hand. Assemble not your hatred, share your love. By heaven, my soul is purged from grudging hate, and with my hand, I seal my true heart's love. So thrive I as I truly swear the like. Madam, you are not exempt from this, nor your son Dorset, Buckingham, nor you. You have been factious, one against the other. Wife, love Lord Hastings. Let him kiss your hand. And what you do, do it unswervedly. There, Hastings. I will never more remember our former hatred. So thrive I and mine. And embrace it. Hastings love, Lord Marcus. This interchange of love I here protest upon my part shall be inviolable. And so swear I. Now, Princely Buckingham, seal thou this league with affections for my wife's allies and make me happy in your unity. 
Whenever Buckingham doth turn his hate upon your grace, but methought you his love doth cherish you and yours, God punish me with hate in those where I expect most love. A pleasing cordial, princely Buckingham, is this thy vow unto my sickly heart? We wanteth now our brother Gloucester here to mark the blessed period of this peace. And in good time, here comes Sir Richard Ratcliffe and the Duke. Good morrow to my sovereign king and queen, and princely peers, a happy time of day. Happy indeed, as we have spent the day. Brother, we have done deeds of charity, made peace of enmity, and fair love of hate between these swelling, wrong, insensitive peers. A most blessed deed, my sovereign lord. Among this princely heap, if any here, by false intelligence or wrong surmise, hold me a foe. If I unwittingly or in my rage have aught committed that is hardly borne by any in this presence, I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. Tis death to me to be at enmity. I hate it and desire all good men's love. First, madam, I entreat true peace of you, which I will purchase with my duteous service. Of you, my noble cousin Buckingham, if ever any grudge were lodged between us. Of you, Lord Rivers, and Lord Grey, of you, that any who have frowned on me without desert, dukes, earls, lords, gentlemen, indeed of all, I do not know that Englishman alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds, more than the infant that is born tonight. I thank my God for my humility. A holy day shall this be kept hereafter. I would to God all strikes were well compounded, my sovereign lord, I do beseech your highness to take our brother Clarence to your grace. Why, madam, have I offered love for this? To be so flouted in this royal presence? Who knows not that the gentle duke is dead? You do him injury to scorn his corpse. Who knows not he is dead? Who knows he is? Oh, seeing heaven, what a world is this? Look I so pale, Lord Dorset, as the rest? Aye, my good lord, and no one in the presence but his red color hath forsook his cheeks. Is Clarence dead? The order was reversed. But he, poor man, by your first order died, and that a winged mercury did bear. Some tardy cripple bore the counterman that came to lag to see him bury it. God grant that some, less noble and less loyal, nearer in bloody thoughts but not in blood, deserve not worse than wretched Clarence did, and yet go current from suspicion. My brother slew no man. His fault was thought, and yet his punishment was bitter death. Who sued to me for him? Who in my wrath kneeled at my feet and bid me be advised? Who spoke of brotherhood? Who spoke of love? Who told me how the poor soul did forsake the mighty Warwick and did fight for me? Who told me on the field at Tewkesbury when Oxford had me down, he rescued me and said, dear brother, live and be a king who... <coughs> All this from remembrance, brutish wrath, sinfully plucked. Not a man of you had so much grace as to put it in my mind. For my brother, not a man of you would speak, nor I, ungracious, speak it to myself for him, poor soul. Oh God, I fear thy judgment will take hold on me. In you, in mine, in yours for this. Come, Hastings, help me to my closet. Oh, poor Clarence. This is the fruits of rashness. Marked you not how that the guilty kindred of the queen looked pale when they did hear of Clarence's death? Oh, they did urge it still unto the king. God will revenge it. Come, Lord, will you go to comfort Edward with our company? We wait upon your grace.
no, girl. Why do you weep so oft? And be your best and cry, O oh, clans, my unhappy son. Why do you look on us and call us wretches, orphans, castaways, if that our noble father were alive? My pretty cousins, you mistake me both. I do lament the sickness of the king as loath to lose him, not your father's death. It were lost sorrow to wail one that's lost. Then you conclude, Grenham, he is dead. The king, mine uncle, is to blame for this. God will revenge it, whom I will importune with earnest prayers, all to that effect. And so will I. Oh, peace, children, peace. The king doth love you well. Incapable and shallow innocence. You cannot guess who caused your father's death. Grenham, we can. For my good uncle Gloucester told me that the king, provoked to it by the queen, devised impeachments to imprison him. And when my uncle told me so, he wept and pitied me and kindly kissed my cheek and bade me rely on him as on my father and he would love me as dearly as his child. That deceit should steal such gentle shape and with a virtuous visor hide deep vice. He is my son, I, and therein my shame. Thank you, my uncle, to dissemble, Grandma. I, girl. No. I cannot oh. think. What time is this? Who oh, shall hinder me to wail and weep, to chide my fortune and torment myself? I'll join with black despair against my soul and to myself become an enemy. What means this scene of rude impatience? To mark an act of tragic violence. Edward, my lord, thy son, our king, is dead. Why grow the branches when the root is gone? Why wither not the leaves that want their sap? If thou would live, lament. If die, be brief, that our swift-winged souls may catch the kings. Or like obedient subjects, follow him to his new kingdom of ne'er changing oh, night. So much interest have I in thy sorrow, as I had title in thy noble husband. I have bewept a worthy husband's death, and lived with looking on his images. But death hath snatched my husband from mine arms, and plucked two crutches from my feeble hands, Clarence and Edward. Thou art a mother. Yet thou art a widow, but thou hast the, the pleasure and the comfort of thy children left. Oh, what cause have I, thine being but a moiety of my moan, to overgo thy woes and drown thy cries? Give me no help in lamentations. I am not barren to bring forth complaints. All springs reduce their currents to mine eyes, that I, being governed by the watery moon, may send forth plenteous tears to drown the world oh, for my husband, for my dear Lord and Was ever widow had so dear a loss? Whoever orphans had so dear a loss? Was ever mother had so dear a loss? Alas, I am the mother of these griefs. Their woes are parceled, mine is general. Alas, you three on me, threefold distressed, pour all your tears. I am your sorrow's nurse, and I will pamper it with lamentation. <laughs> Sister, have comfort. All of us have cause to wail the dimming of our shining star, but none of us can help our hearts by wailing. Madam, my mother, I do cry thee mercy. I did not see your grace. Humbly on my knee, I crave thy blessing. God bless thee, and put meekness in thy breast, love, charity, obedience, and true duty. Amen. And make me die a good old man. That is the but end of a mother's blessing. I marvel that her grace did leave it out. You cloudy princes and heart-sorrowing peers that bear this heavy mutual load of moan, now cheer each other in each other's love. Though we have spent our harvest of this king, we are to reap the harvest of his son. Beseemeth good that with some little train forthwith from Ludlow the young prince, 
be fed hither to London to be crowned our king. Then be it so, and go we to determine who they shall be that straight shall post to Ludlow. Madam, and you, my sister, will you go to give your censures in this weighty business? With all our With hearts. hearts. My lord, whoever journeys to the prince, for God's sake, let not us two stay at home. For by the way, I'll sort occasion, as index to the story we late spoke of, to part the queen's proud kindred from the prince. My other self, my counsel's consistory, my oracle, my prophet, my dear cousin, I, as a child, will go by thy direction. Towards Ludlow, then, for we'll not stay behind. Whither away so fast? I promise you, I scarcely know myself. Hear you the news abroad? Aye, that the king is dead. Oh, ill news by your lady, I fear. I fear twill prove a giddy world. Neighbors, Godspeed. Give you good morrow, sir. Doth the news hold of good King Edward's death? Aye, sir, it is too true. God help the while. Then, masters, look to see a troublous world. Oh, no, no. By God's good grace, his son shall reign. Woe to the land that's governed by a child. In him there is the hope of government, and in his non-age, counsel under him. And he in his full and ripened years shall then, and till then, no doubt, govern well. So stood the state when Henry the Sixth was crowned in Paris. And he but nine months old. Uh, stood the state so? No, no, friends, God wot. For then this land was famously enriched with politic, grave counsel. Then the king had virtuous uncles to protect his grace. Oh, and so had this, both by his father and his mother. Better it were they were all from his father, or from his father there were none at all. Oh, full of danger is the Duke of Gloucester, and the queen's sons and brothers, hot and proud. And were they to be ruled and not to rule, this sickly land might solace as before. Come, come, we fear the worst. All will be well. When clouds are seen, wise men put on their cloaks. When great leaves fall, winter is at hand. When the sun doth set, who does not look for night? All may be well, but if God sort it so, it is more than we deserve or I expect. Truly, the hearts of men have been full of fear. You cannot almost reason with a man that looks not heavily and full of dread. By divine instinct, men's minds mistrust ensuing danger, as by proof we see the waters swell before the boisterous storm. But leave it all to God. Whither away? Marry, I was sent for to the justices. I was myself. I'll bear you company. Stony Stratford they do rest tonight. Tomorrow or the next day they will be here. Oh, I long with all my heart to see the prince. I hope he is much grown since last I saw him. But I hear no. They say my son of York hath almost o'ertaken him in his growth. Aye, mother. But I would not have so. Oh, why, my young cousin, it is good to grow. Grand, grand. One night as we did to the supper. My uncle Rivers talked to the girl more than my brother. I was my uncle Gloucester. Small herbs have raised close leaves to grow face. And since we think so, it not grow so fast, but sweet flowers are slow, and we make haste. Oh, good faith, good faith. <laughs> the saying did not hold in him that did object the same to thee. He was the wretched when he was young, and so leisurely and so long a growing, that if his rule were true, he should be gracious. Why, so no doubt he is, my gracious madam. I hope he Here comes your son, Lord Dorset. What news, Lord Marcus? Such news, my lord, as grieves me to report. How doth the prince? Well, madam, and in health. What is thy news, then? Lord Rivers and Lord Grey are sent to Pomfret, and with them Thomas Vaughan, prisoners. Who hath committed them? The mighty dukes, Gloucester and Buckingham. For what offense? Some of all I can I have disclosed. 
why or for what the nobles were committed is all unknown to me, my gracious lord. I me, I see the ruin of our house. The tiger now had seized the gentle hind. Oh, cursed and unquiet wrangling days. How many of you have mine eyes beheld? Oh, let me die to look on death no more. Come, come, my boy. We will to sanctuary. Madam, farewell. Oh, stay, I will go with you. You have no cause. My gracious lady, go, and thither bear your treasure and your goods. For my part, I'll resign it to your grace the seal I keep, and so be tied to me as well I tender you and yours. Go, I'll accompany you to sanctuary. <coughs> to your chamber. Welcome, dear cousin, my thought sovereign. The weary way hath made you melancholy. No, uncle, but the crosses on the way have made it weary, tedious, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. Sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. Those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugared words, but looked not on the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them and from such false friends. God keep me from false friends, but they were none. My lord, the mayor of London comes to greet you. God bless your grace with health and happy days. I thank you, good my lord, and thank you all. I thought my mother and my brother York, who long ere this had met us on the way. Ah, oh, my lord, what, will my mother come? On what occasion, God, he knows not I. The queen, your mother, and your brother York have taken sanctuary. The tender prince would fain have come with me to meet your grace. But why his mother was perforce withheld. Why, what an indirect and peevish course is this of hers. Lord Bishop, will your grace persuade the queen to send the Duke of York unto his princely brother presently? If she deny Lord Hastings, go with him, and from her jealous arms, pluck him perforce. My Lord of Buckingham, if my weak oratory can from his mother win the Duke of York, I none expect him. Lord Hastings, will you go with me? I come, my lord. Good lords, make all the speedy haste you may. Say, Uncle Gloucester, if our brother comes, where shall we sojourn to our coronation? Where it seems best unto your royal self, if I may counsel you, some day or two your highness shall repose you in the tower, then where you please and shall be thought most fit for your best health and recreation. I do not like the tower of any place. Did Julius Caesar build that place, my lord? He did, my gracious lord, begin that place, which since succeeding ages have re-edified. So wise, so young, they say, do never live long. What say you, uncle? I say, without character, Spain lives long. <laughs> Thus, like the formal vice iniquity, I moralize two meanings in one word. Now, in good time, here comes the Duke of York. Ah, Richard of York, how fares our loving brother? Well, my dread lord, so I must call you now. Aye, to our grief as it is yours. Too soon died he that might have kept that title, which by his death hath lost much majesty. How fares our noble cousin, Duke of York? I thank you, gentle uncle, well. Oh, my lord, you said the other weeds were fast and good. The prince, my brother, hath not grown me far. He hath, my lord. And therefore is he idle. Oh, my fair cousin, I must not say so. <laughs> it's more beholden to you than I. Well. He may command me as my sovereign, but you hold power in me as a kinsman. Wilt please you pass along, my lord. Myself and my good cousin Buckingham will unto your mother to entreat of her to meet you at the tower and welcome you. What? You go on to the tower, my lord? My lord protector needs will have it so. I will not keep him quiet at the tower. Why? What should you fear there? Mary, Uncle Clarence Andrew Ghost. My grandma told me he was murdered there. I fear no uncle's dead. Nor none that live, I hope. And if they live, I hope I need not fear. But come, my lord, and with the heavy heart. 
thinking on them. Go we unto the tower. Think you, my lord, this little prating York was not incensed by his subtle mother to taunt and scorn you thus opprobriously? No doubt, no doubt. Oh, tis a marvelous boy, bold, quick, and genius, forward, capable. He is all the mothers from the top to toe. Well, let them rest. Come hither, Kate. Thou art sworn as closely to conceal what we impart as deeply to effect what we intend. Thou knowest our reasons, urged upon the way. What thinkst thou? Is it not an easy matter to make William Lord Hastings of our mind for the installment of this noble duke in the seat royal of this famous isle? He, for his father's sake, so loves the prince that he will not be won to aught against him. What thinkst thou then of Stanley? Will not he? Uh, he will do all in all his Hastings stuff. Well then, no more but this. Go, gentle Catesby, and as it were far off, sound thou, Lord Hastings, how he doth stand affected to our purpose. If thou dost find him tractable to us, encourage him, and tell him all our reasons. If he be leaden, icy, cold, unwilling, be thou so too. And so break off your talk, and give us notice of his inclination. For we tomorrow hold divided counsels, wherein thyself shalt highly be employed. Commend me to Lord <laughs> William. Tell him, Catesby, his ancient knot of dangerous adversaries. Tomorrow are let blood at Comfort Castle. Good Catesby, go effect this business sound. My good lord, both with all the heed I can. Shall we hear from you, Catesby, ere we sleep? You shall, my lord. At Crosby House, there you shall find us both. What shall we do, my lord, if we perceive Lord Hastings will not yield to our complots? Chop off his head! <laughs> <laughs> Something we will determine. And look when I am king. Claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford, and all the movables by which my brother the king was possessed. I'll claim that promise at your grace's hand. And look to have it yielded with all kindness. Come, let us sup betimes that we may afterward digest our complots in some form. <laughs> Stanley sleep these tedious nights? <laughs> so it appears by what I have to say. First, he commends him to your noble self. What then? Then certifies your lordship that this night he dreamt the boar had raised it off his helm. Besides, he says, there are two councils kept, and that may be determined at the one, which may make you and he to rule the other. Therefore, he sends to know your lordship's pleasure. If you will presently take horse with him, and with all speed post with him towards the north, to shun the danger his soul divines. Go, fellow, go, return unto thy lord. Bid him not fear the separated counsels. His honour and myself are at the one, and at the other is my good friend Catesby, where nothing can proceed that toucheth us, whereof I shall not have intelligence. My lord, tell him his fears are shallow, without instance, for his dreams. <laughs> No wonder he's so simple to trust the mockery of unquiet slumbers. Go, bid your master rise and come to me, and we will both together to the tower, where he will see the poor shall use us kindly. I'll go, my lord, and tell him what you say. Many good morrows, my noble lord. Good morrow, Catesby. You are early stirring. Uh, what news? What news in this our uh, tottering state? Uh, it is a reeling world indeed, my lord, and I believe it will not stand upright. So, Richard, where's the garland of the realm? Where's the garland? Dost thou mean the crown? Aye, my good lord. I'll have this crown of mine cut from my shoulders ere I'll see the crown so foul misplaced. But canst thou guess that he doth aim at it? Aye, on my life, and hopes to find you forward upon his party for the gain thereof, and thereupon send you this good news that 
the same very day your enemies, the kindred of the queen, must die at Pomfret. <laughs> Indeed, I, I am no mourner for that news, because they have been still my adversaries, sir. But that I'll give my voice on Richard's side, to bar my master's heirs in true descent? God knows I will not do it, to the death. God, keep your lordship in that gracious mind. Tis a vile thing to die, my gracious lord, when men are unprepared and look not for it. Oh, monstrous, monstrous. <laughs> and so falls it out with rivers born gray. And so it will do with some men else that think themselves as safe as thou and I, who as thou knowest. Ah, oh, dear to princely Richard and to Buckingham. Mm. Both princes make high account of you. I know they do, and I have well deserved it. <laughs> Come on, come on, what is your boar spear, man? My lord, good morrow, good morrow, Casey. You may jest on, but by the holy root, I do not like these several counsels I have. My lord, I hold my life as dear as you do yours. And then never in my days I do protest was it so precious to me as tis now. Think you but that I knew our state secure, I would be so triumphant as I am. The lords of Pompous, when they wrote when they rode from London were jocund and supposed their state was sure. And indeed they had no cause to mistrust. But what? Shall we toward the tower? This day is spent. <laughs> come, come, have with you. What you what, my lord? Today the lords you talked of are beheaded. Oh, well they for their truth might better wear their hats and some that accuse them wear their hats. But come, my lord, let us away. Uh, go on before, I'll follow presently. Well met, my lord. I'm glad to see your honor. Thank thee, good Sir John, with all my heart. <clears throat> I'm in your debt for your last exercise. Come the next Sabbath, I will content you. What? Talking with a priest, Lord Chamberlain? Your friends at Pomfret, they do need the priest. Your lordship hath no shriving work in hand. Good faith, and, and when I met this holy man, the men you talk of came into my mind. <laughs> Uh, what, go you toward the tower? I do, my lord, but long I cannot stay there. I shall return before your lordship then. Oh, nay, like enough, for I stay dinner there. And supper too, although thou know'st it not. Come, will you go? Um, I'll wait upon your lordship. <laughs> Sir Richard Radcliffe, let me tell thee this. Today thou shalt see a subject die for truth, for duty, and for loyalty. God bless the prince from all the pack of you, and not you are of damned bloodsuckers. You live that shall cry woe for this hereafter. Dispatch. The limit of your lives is out. O oh, Pomfret, Pomfret, O oh, thou bloody prison, fatal and ominous to noble peers. Within the guilty closure of thy walls, Richard II here was hacked to death. And for more slander to thy dismal seat, we give to thee our guiltless blood to drink. Well, now Margaret's curse has fallen upon our heads for standing by when Richard stabbed her son. Then cursed she Hastings, then cursed she Buckingham, then cursed she Richard. Oh, remember God, to hear her prayers for them is now for us, and for my sister and her princely sons. Be satisfied, dear God, with our true blood which, as thou knowest, unjustly must be spilt. Make haste. The hour of death is expiate. Come, Gray. Let us here embrace. Farewell, Vaughn. Until we meet again in heaven. is to determine of the coronation. In God's name, <coughs> speak. When is the royal day? Is all things ready for that solemn time? It is at once but the nomination. Tomorrow, I think, a happy day. Who knows the Lord Protector's mind herein? Who is most inward with the noble duke? Your grace, methinks, should soonest know his mind. We know each other's faces. For our hearts he knows no more of mine than I of yours, or I of his, my lord, than you of mine. Lord Hastings, you and he are near in love. I thank his grace. I know he loves me well, but, but for his purpose in the coronation, I have not sounded him, and nor he delivered uh, his gracious pleasure any way therein. 
In happy time, here comes the Duke himself. My noble lords and cousins all, good morrow. I have been long a sleeper, but I trust my absence doth neglect no great design which by my presence might have been concluded. Had you not come upon your view, my lord, William Lord Hastings had pronounced your part, I mean your voice, for crowning of the king. Then, my lord Hastings, no man might be bolder. His lordship knows me well and loves me well. My lord of Eve. When last I was in Holborn, I saw good strawberries in your garden there. I beseech you, send for some of them. Mary, I will with all my heart. Cousin of Buckingham, a word with you. Catesby hath sounded Hastings in our business and finds the testy gentleman so hot that he will lose his head and give consent his master's child, as he worshipfully terms it, shall lose the royalty of England's throne. Withdraw yourself a while. I'll go with you. We have not yet set down the day of trial. Tomorrow, in my opinion, is too sudden. I myself am not so well provided as else I would be were the day prolonged. Where is my lord, the Duke of Gloucester? I have sent for these strawberries. His grace looks cheerfully and smooth this morning. Uh, that some conceit or other likes him well when that he bids good morrow with such spirit. <laughs> I think there's never a man in Christendom that uh, can lesser hide his love or hate than he, uh, for by his face straight shall you know his heart. <laughs> what if his heart perceived you in his face by any likelihood he showed today? Uh, uh, marry that with no man here he is offended, <laughs> or were he here shown it in his looks. <laughs> I pray God he be not. <laughs> I pray you all. Tell me what they deserve that do conspire my death with devilish plots of damned witchcraft and thus have prevailed upon my body with their hellish charms. The tender love I bear, your grace, my lord, makes me most forward in this princely presence to doom the offenders whatsoever they be. Uh, I say, my lord, they have deserved death. <laughs> then be your eyes the witness of their evil. See. How I am bewitched! Behold, mine arm is like a blasted sapling, withered up, and this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch, consorted with that harlot strumpet shore, that by their witchcraft thus have mocked me. If they have done this deed, my lord, uh, if thou protector of this damned strumpet, talkst thou to me of ifs? Thou art a traitor. Off with his head. Now by St. Paul, I swear, I will not dine until I see the same. Some see it done. The rest that love me, come and follow me. Woe to England, <laughs> not a wit for me, for I, too fond, might have prevented this. Stanley did dream the board did raise our helms, but I did scorn it, and disdain to fly. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curses lighted on poor Hastings' wretched head. Come, come, dispatch. The Duke would be at supper. He make a short shrift of it. He makes he longs to see your head. <laughs> Bloody Richard. Miserable England. I prophesy the fearfulest time to thee that ever wretched age hath looked upon. Come. Lead me to the block. Bring in my head. They smile at me who shortly shall be dead. Clarence, Edward, Rivers, Grey, Vaughan, and Hastings gone away. Are more to die? I cannot tell who will fall to Richard's spell. 
Dying actors need a break. So do you, to keep awake. Therefore, tis time with your permission for a pleasing intermission. Refreshments wait in yonder stand, partake, converse, recover, and if nature's call is insupportable, we also offer potties portable. <laughs> but when the drum begins to beat, hasten back and take your seat. God bless you all, for then you will see King Richard end in misery. Good to see you. Here comes the mayor. Let me alone to entertain him. Lord Mayor, look to the drawbridge there! Hark! A drum! Hates me! Oh, look the walls! Lord Mayor, the reason we have Look set... behind you! Defend! Here be enemies! God and our innocents defend and guard us! Oh, oh, be quiet. It is Kate Speed. Here's the head of that ignoble traitor, the dangerous and unsuspected Hastings. So dear, I loved the man that I must weep. I took him for the plainest, harmless creature that breathed upon the earth. A Christian made him my book, wherein my soul recorded the history of all her secret that covered sheltered traitor that ever lived. Would you imagine or almost believe, were it not that by great preservation we live to tell it, that the subtle traitor had plotted this day in the council house to murder me and my good lord of Gloucester? Had he done so? What? Think you we are Turks or infidels that we would, against the form of law, proceed thus rashly with the villain's death, but that the extreme peril of the case, the peace of England, and our person's safety, enforced us to this execution? Now there befall you. He deserved his death. And your good graces both have well proceeded to warn false traitors from the like attempts. And yet had we not determined he should die until your lordship came to see his end, which now the loving haste of these our friends, something against our meanings, have prevented. Because, my lord, we would have had you hear the traitor speak and timorously confess the manner and the purpose of his treason, that you might well signify the same unto the citizens who haply may misconstrue us in him and wail his death. But, my good lord, your grace's word shall serve as well as I have seen and heard him speak. And do not doubt, right noble princes both, but I'll acquaint our duteous citizens with all your just proceedings in this cause. And to that end we wished your lordship here to avoid the censures of the carping world. Which, since you come too late of our intent, yet witness what you hear we did intend. And so, my good Lord Mayor, we bid adieu. Go after, after Cousin Buckingham. The mayor towards Guildhall hies him in all post. There, at your meetest vantage of the time, infer the bastardy of Edward's children. Moreover, urge his hateful luxury and his bestial appetite in change of lust, which stretched under his servants, daughters, wives. Nay, for a need thus far come near my person. Tell them, when that my mother went with child of that insatiate Edward, noble York, my princely father, then had wars in France, and by true computation of the time found that the issue was not his begot, which well appeared in his lineaments being nothing like the noble duke, my father. But touch this sparingly, as twere far off, for you know, my lord, my mother lives. Doubt not, my lord, I'll play the orator as if the golden fee for which I plead were for myself. If you thrive well, bring them to Baynard's castle, where you shall find me well accompanied with reverend fathers and well-learned bishops. <laughs> I go, my lord, and towards three or four o'clock, look for the news the Guildhall affords. Now will I in to take some privy order to draw the brats of Clarence out of sight, and to give notice that no man or person have any time recourse unto the princes. He 
here is the indictment of the good Lord Hastings, which in a set hand fairly is engrossed that it may be today read over in Paul's. Mark you how well the sequel hangs together. Eleven hours I have spent to write it over, for yesternight by Catesby was it brought me. The precedent was full as long a doing, and yet within these five hours Hastings live, free, unexamined, untainted, at liberty. Here's a good world the while. Oh. Bad is the world, and all will come to naught, and such ill-dealing must be seen and fought. How now, how now, what say the citizens? Now by the holy mother of our Lord, the citizens are mum, say not a word. Touched you not the bastardy of Edward's children? I did, with his contract with Lady Lucy, and his contract by deputy in France. His tyranny for trifles, his own bastardy, as being God your father then in France, and his resemblance being not like the Duke. Withal, I did infer your lineaments, being the right idea of your father, both in your face and nobleness of mind, laid open all your victories in Scotland, your discipline in war, wisdom in peace, your bounty, virtue, fair humility. And when mine oratory grew toward an end, I bid them that did love their country's good cry, God save Richard, England's royal king. And did they so? No, so God help me, they spake not a word. <laughs> but like dumb statues or breathing stones, stared each on other and looked deadly pale, which when I saw I reprehended them and asked the mayor, what meant this willful silence? His answer was, the people were not used to be spoke to but by the recorder. Then he was urged to tell my tale again. Thus saith the Duke, thus hath the Duke inferred. But nothing spoke in warrant from himself. When he had done, some followers of mine own at the lower end of the hall hurled up their caps and some ten voices cried, God save King Richard. And thus I took the advantage of these few. Thanks, gentle citizens and friends, quoth I, this general applause and cheerful shout argues your wisdoms and your love to Richard. And even here break off and came away. What tongueless blocks were they, would they not speak? No, by my troth, my lord. And the mayor and his brethren, will they come? The mayor is here at hand. Intend some fear. Be not you spoke with, but by mighty suit. And look, you get a prayer book in your hand. And stand between two churchmen, good my lord, for on that ground I'll build a holy deskin. Be not easily won to our request. Play the maid's part. Still answer nay, and take it. I go. And if you plead as well for them, as I can say nay to thee for myself, no doubt we'll bring it to a happy issue. Go, go, the Lord Mayor comes. Welcome, my lord. I dance attendance here. I think the Duke will not be spoke with all. Oh, now take thee. What says your lord to my request? Uh, he doth entreat your grace, my noble lord, to visit him tomorrow or the next day. He is within with two right reverend fathers, divinely bent to meditation, and in no worldly suit will he be drawn from his holy exercise. Return, gentle Catesby, to your gracious prince. Tell him myself, the mayor and alderman, in deep designs, in matter of great moment, no less important than the general good, are come to have some conference with his grace. I'll signify unto him straight. Aha, uh -huh, my lord, this prince is not in Edward. He is not lolling in a lewd day bed, but on his knees at meditation. Happy were England, would this mighty prince take on himself the sovereignty thereof. But sure, I fear we will not win him to it. Mary, God defend his grace should say us nay. Oh, my. Not nay. See. See where his grace stands between two clergymen. <laughs> two props of virtue for a Christian prince to stay him from the fall of vanity. And look, a book of prayer in his hand. Famous Plantagenet, most virtuous prince, lend favorable ear to our request and pardon us this interruption of thy devotion and right Christian zeal. My lord, there needs no such apology. I do beseech your grace to pardon me, who, 
earnest in the service of my God, deferred the visitation of my friends. But leaving this, what is your grace's pleasure? Even that, my lord, which pleaseth God above, and all good men of this ungoverned isle. I do suspect I have done some offense that seems disgracious in the city's eye, and that you come to reprehend me for my ignorance. You have, my lord. Would it might please your grace on our entreaties to amend your fault? Else wherefore breathe I in a Christian world? Know then, it is your fault that you resign the supreme seat, the throne majestical, to the corruption of a blemished stock, whilst in the mildness of your sleepy thoughts, which here we waken to our country's good, the noble owl doth want her proper limbs, her face defaced with scars of infamy, which, to recure, we heartily solicit your royal self to take on you the charge and kingly government of this your land, not as protector, steward, substitute, or lowly factor for a mother's gain, but as successively, from blood to blood, your right of birth, your empery, your own. I do not know whether to depart in silence or bitterly to speak in your reproof best fitteth my degree or your condition. Your love deserves my thanks, but my desert, unmeritable, shuns your high request. My lord, this argues conscience in your grace, and yet the respects thereof are nice and trivial, all circumstances well considerate. You say that Edward is your brother's son, so say we all, but not by Edward's son, but not by Edward's wife, for first was he contract to Lady Lucy. Your mother lives a witness to his vow and afterwards by substitute betrothed to Bona, sister to the king of France. These both put off. A poor petitioner seduced the pitch and height of his degree to base declension and loathe bigamy. By her, in his unlawful bed, he got this Edward, whom our manners call the prince. More bitterly could I expostulate, save that for reverence to some alive, I give a sparing limit to my tongue. Then. Good, my lord, take to yourself this proffered benefit of dignity, if not to bless us and the land withal, yet to draw forth your noble ancestry from the corruption of abusing times unto a lineal, true, derived course. Do, my lord, your citizens entreat you. Refuse not, mighty lord, this proffered love. Make them joyful, grant them lawful suit. Alas, would you heap this care on me? I am unfit for state and majesty. I do beseech you, take it not amiss. I cannot, nor I will not yield to you. Your brother's son shall never reign our king, but we shall plant another in the throne to the disgrace and downfall of your house. And in this resolution here we leave you. Come, citizens, swoons, I'll entreat no more. Oh, do not swear, cousin of Buckingham. Call them back, sweet prince. If you deny them all, the land will rue it. Would you enforce me to a world of cares? Call them back. Oh, my lord! <laughs> my lord! <laughs> I am not made of stone, <laughs> but penetrable to your kind entreats, albeit against my conscience and my soul cousin of Buckingham and grave sage men, since you will buckle fortune on my back, I must have patience to endure the load. For God doth know, and you may partly see, how far I am from the desire of this. God bless your grace. We see it, and we'll say it. In saying so, you shall but say the truth. Then we salute you with this royal title. Long live King Richard, England's worthy king. Long live King Richard! Tomorrow may it please you to be crowned. Even when you please, for you will have it so. Tomorrow then we shall attend your grace. And so, most joyously, we take our leave. Let us to our holy work again. Farewell, dear cousin. Farewell, gentle friend. Thank <laughs> you.
Sister, whither away? No farther than the tower, and as I guess upon the like devotion of yourselves to graduate the gentle princes there. Kind sister, thanks. We'll enter all together. And in good time here Lady Betty comes. My Lady Betty, pray you by your leave, how doth the prince and my young son of York? Right well, dear madam. But by your patience, may I suffer you not to visit them? The king hath strictly charged the contrary. The king? Who's that? I mean the Lord Protector. The Lord Protecting from that kingly title. Hath he set bounds between their love and me? I am their mother. Who shall bar me from them? I am their father's mother. I will see them. Their aunt I am in law. In love their mother. Then bring me to their sides. I'll bear thy blame and take thy office from thee on my peril. No, madam, no. I may not leave it so. I am bound by oath, and so therefore, pardon me. Let me but meet you ladies one hour hence, and I'll salute your grace of York as mother and reverend looker on of two fair queens. Come, madam, you must straight to Westminster, there to be crowned Richard's royal queen. I'll cut my lace asunder that my pent heart may have some scope to be here, or else I swoon with this dead killing news. Despiteful tidings, O unpleasing news. Be of good cheer. Mother, how fares your grace? Oh, Dorset, speak not to me. Get thee gone. Death and destruction dog thee at thy heels. Thy mother's name is ominous to children. If thou wilt outstrip death, go. Cross the seas and live with Richmond from the reach of hell. Go, hide thee. Hide thee from this slaughterhouse lest thou increase the numbers of the dead and make me die the thrall of Margaret's curses, no mother, wife, nor counted England's queen. Full of wise care is this your counsel, madam. Take all the swift advantage of the hours. You shall have letters for me to my son on your behalf to meet you on the way. Be not taken tardy by unwise delay. Now come, madam, come. I in all haste was sent. And I in all unwillingness will go. I would to God that inclusive verge of golden metal that must round my brow were red hot steel to sear me to the brains. Anointed let me be with deadly venom and die ere men can say, God save the queen. Go, go, poor soul, I envy not thy glory. To feed my humor, wish thyself no harm. No, what? When he that is my husband now came to me as I followed Henry's corpse, when I say I looked on Richard's face. This was my wish. Be thou, quoth I, a curse for making me so young, so old a widow. And when thou wets, let sorrow haunt thy bed. And be thy wife, if any be so mad, more miserable by the life of thee than thou hast made me by my dear Lord's death. Oh, ere I can repeat this curse again, Within so small a time, my woman's heart grossly grew captive to his honey words, and proved the subject of mine own soul's curse. For never yet one hour in his bed did I enjoy the golden dew of sleep. But with his timorous dreams were still awake. Poor heart, adieu, I pity thy complaining. No more than with my soul I mourn for yours. Go thou to Richmond and good fortune guide thee. Go thou to Richard, and good angels tend thee. Go thou to sanctuary, and good thoughts possess thee. I to my grave, where peace and rest lie with thee. Stay, yet look back with me unto the tower. Pity you ancient stones, those tender babes whom envy hath immured within your walls. Rough cradle for such little pretty ones. Rude, ragged nurse. Use my babies well.
stand all apart? Cousin of Buckingham, my gracious son, give me thy hand. Thus high by thy advice and thy assistance is King Richard seated. But shall we wear these glories for a day, or shall they last and we rejoice in them? Still live they, and forever let them last. <laughs> ah, Buckingham. Now do I play the touch to try if thou be current gold indeed. Young Edward lives. Think now what I would speak. Say on, my loving lord. Why, Buckingham, I say I would be king. Why, so you are, my thrice-renowned liege. Aha! Am I king? Tis so. But Edward lives. True, noble prince. Oh, bitter <coughs> consequence that Edward should still live. True. Noble prince, cousin, thou wast not wont to be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastards dead. Have it immediately performed. What sayest thou now? Speak suddenly, be brief. Your grace may do your pleasure. Tut, tut, thou art all ice. Thy kindness freezes. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? Give me some little pause, some breath, my lord, before I speak positively in this. I shall resolve you presently herein. The king is angry. He gnaws his lip. I will converse with iron-witted fools and unrespective boys. None are for me that look into me with considerate eyes. High-reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. Boy. My lord. Knowst thou not any whom corrupting gold would tempt unto a close exploit of death? I know a discontented gentleman whose humble means match not his haughty spirit. Gold were as good as twenty orders and would no doubt tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrrell. I partly know the man. Go call him hither, boy. The deep revolving witty Buckingham no more shall be neighbor to my counsels. Hath he so long held out with me untired, and now he stops for breath? <coughs> oh, be it so. <coughs> How now, Stanley, what's the news? Oh, my beloved lord, the Marquis Dorset, as I hear, is fled to Richmond, in those lands beyond the seas where he abides. Catesby, come hither. Yes, my lord. Rumor it abroad that Anne, my wife, is grievous sick. Uh, I will take order for keeping her cloak. Thou dreamst, I say again, give out that Anne, my queen, is sick and like to die. About it, for it stands me much upon to give up all hopes whose growth may damage me. I must be married to my brother's daughter, or my kingdom stands on brittle glass. Murder her brothers and then marry her. Uncertain way of gain. But I am in. So far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Tear-falling pity dwells not in this eye. Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient servant. Art thou indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Darest thou resolve to kill a friend of mine? Please you, I had rather kill two enemies. Why, there thou hast it, two deep enemies. Foes to my rest and my sweet sleep's disturbers are they that I would have you deal upon, Tyrrell. I mean those bastards in the tower. Give me open means of access to them, and I'll rid you of the fear of them. Thou singst sweet music, Tyrrell. Come, hither. Go. By this token, say it is done, and I will love thee and prefer thee for it. I'll dispatch it straight. Shall we hear from you, Tyrrell, ere we sleep? You shall, my lord. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late request that you did sound me in. Well, let that rest. Dorset is fled to Richmond. I hear the news, my lord. Stanley, he is your wife's son. Well, look to it. My lord, I claim the gift, my due, by promise, for which your honor and your faith are upon. The earldom of Hereford, and the, all the movables which you have promised I shall possess. Stanley, 
Look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. What says your highness to my justice? I do remember me. Henry the Sixth did prophesy that Richmond should be king when Richmond was a little peevish boy. A king, perhaps, perhaps. My lord. How chance that the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being by, that I should kill him. My lord, your promise for the earl, though. Aye, what's o'clock? I am thus bold to put your grace in mind of what you have promised me. Aye, but what's o'clock? Upon the stroke of ten. Well, let it strike. Why let it strike? Because that, like a jack, thou keep'st the stroke betwixt thy begging and my meditation. I am not in the giving vein today. Why then, resolve me where you will or no. Thou troublest me. I am not in the vein! And is it thus? Repays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone to Brecon while my fearful head is on. Tyrannous and bloody act is done. The most arch deed of piteous massacre that ever yet this land was guilty of. Dighton and Forrest, whom I did suborn to do this piece of ruthless butchery, albeit they were flesh and villains, bloody dogs, melted with tenderness and mild compassion, wept like children at their death's sad story. Hence they are gone with conscience and remorse. They could not speak, and so I left them to bear these tidings to the bloody king. And here he comes. All health, my gracious sovereign. Kind Tyrrell, am I happy in thy news? If to have done that which you gave in charge beget your happiness, then be happy, for it is done. But didst thou see them dead? I did, my lord. And buried, gentle tear. The chaplain of the tower hath buried them, but where to tell the truth I do not know. Come to me, Tyrrell, soon, at after supper, when thou shalt tell the process of their death. Meantime, but think how I may do thee good and be inheritor of thy desire. I humbly take my leave. The sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom. And Anne, my wife, hath bid this world good night. Now, for I know the Breton Richmond aims at young Elizabeth, and by that knot proudly o'erlooks the crown, to her go I, a jolly, thriving wooer. So, now prosperity begins to melt and drop into the rotten mouth of death. Here in these confines, slyly have I lurked to watch the waning of mine enemies. A dire induction am I witness to, and will to France, hoping the consequence may be as bitter, black, and tragical. Withdraw the wretched Margaret, who comes here. Oh, my poor princess. Oh, my tender babes. <laughs> if yet thy gentle souls fly in the air, hover about me with your airy wings and hear your mother's lamentation. So many miseries have crazed my voice that my woe-weary tongue is still and mute. <laughs> Wilt thou, O oh God, fly from such gentle lambs? When didst thou sleep when such a deed was done? 
Oh, that thou wouldst as soon afford a grave as thou canst yield a melancholy seat, then would I hide my bones, not rest them here. Oh, who hath any cause to mourn but we? If ancient sorrows be most reverend, give mine the benefit of seniory, and let my griefs frown on the upper hand. If sorrow can admit society, tell all your woes again by viewing mine. I had a husband till a Richard killed him. I had an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Clarence, and a Richard killed him. From out the kennel of thy womb hath crept a hellhound that will hunt us all to death. Oh, upright, just, and true disposing God, how do I thank thee that this charnel cur preys on the issue of his mother's body and makes her pew fellow with others moan? Harry's <laughs> wife triumph not in my woes. God witness with me, I have wept for thy. Bear with me, for I am hungry for revenge. And now I cloy me with beholding it. Richard yet lives, but soon, but soon ensues his piteous and unpitied death. Earth gapes, hell burns, fiends roar, saints pray to have him suddenly conveyed from hence. Oh, cancel his bond of life, O oh God, I pray that I may live to say the dog is dead. Thou didst prophesy the day would come, that I would wish for thee to help me curse this bottle spider, this foul bunch back toad. I called thee then. Vain flourish of my fortune, I call thee then, poor shadow, painted queen. <coughs> Where is thy husband now? Where be thy brothers? Where be thy sons? Wherein dost thou joy? Who kneels and chews and says, God save the queen? Where be the bending peers that flattered thee? Where be the thronging troops that followed thee? Decline all this and see what now thou art. For happy wife, a most distressed widow. For joyful mother, one that wails the name. Farewell, you ox queen. A queen of sad mischance. These English woes will make me smile in France. Oh, thou well skilled in curses, stay a while. And teach me how to curse mine enemies. Forbear to sleep the nights and fast the days. Compare dead happiness with living woe. Think that thy babes were sweeter than they were, and he that slew them fouler than he is. Bettering thy loss makes the bad cause or worse. Revolving this will teach thee how to curse. My words are dull, or quicken them with thine. Thy woes will make them sharp and pierce, like mine. Why should calamity be full of words? Let them have scope. Though what they will impart help nothing else, Yet they do ease the heart. If so, then be not tongue-tied. Go with me, and in the breath of bitter words, let smother my damned son that thy too sweet son smothered. The trumpet sounds, be copious and exclaims. Who intercepts me in my expedition? Oh, she that might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb from all the slaughters, wretch, that thou hast done. Tell me, thou villain slave, where are my children? Thou toad, thou toad, where is thy brother Clarence? Where is the gentle rivers, Vaughn, Gray? Where is kind hasty? Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamation. Art thou my son? Ah, I thank God, my father, and yourself. Then patiently hear my impatience. Madam, I have a touch of your condition that cannot brook the accent of reproof. Oh, let me speak. Do then, but I'll not hear. I will be mild and gentle in my words. And brief, madam, for I am in haste. Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in torment and in agony. And came I not at last to comfort you? No, by the holy rood, thou knowest it well. Thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. If I be so disgracious in thine eye, then let me march on and offend you not, madam. Strike up the drum. I pray 
Brady, hear me speak. You speak too bitterly. Hear me a word, for I shall never speak to thee again. So? <laughs> Either thou wilt die by God's just ordinance, ere from this war thou turn a conqueror, or I with grief and extreme age shall perish, and never more behold thy face again. Therefore take with thee my most heavy curse, which in the day of battle tire thee more than all the complete armor that thou wearest. My prayers on the adverse party fight. There the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies and promise them success and victory. Bloody thou art. Bloody will be thy end. Shame serves thy life, and doth thy death attend. No far more cause, yet much less spirit to curse abides in me. I say amen to all. Stay, madam. I must talk a word with you. I have no more sons of the royal blood for thee to slaughter. For my daughters, Richard, they shall be praying nuns, not weeping queens, and therefore level not to hit their lives. You have a daughter called Elizabeth. Fair and virtuous, royal and gracious. And must she die for this? Oh, let her live, and I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, that she may live unscarred of bleeding slaughter. I will confess, she was not Edward's daughter. Wrong not her birth. She is a royal princess. To save her life, I'll say she is not so. Her life is safest only in her birth. And only in that safety died her brothers. Lo, at their births, good stars were opposite. No, to their lives, ill friends were contrary. Madam, so thrive I in my enterprise and dangerous success of bloody wars, as I intend more good to you and yours than ever you or yours by me were harmed. What good is covered with the face of heaven to be discovered that can do me good? The advancement of your children, gentle lady. Up to some scaffold there to lose their heads. Unto the dignity and height of fortune, the high imperial type of this earth's glory. Flatter my sorrow with report of it. Tell me what state, what dignity, what honor canst thou demise to any child of mine? Even all I have. I, and myself, and all, will I withal endow a child of thy... Be brief, lest that the process of thy kindness tell last longer telling than thy kindness date. Then know that, from my soul, I love your daughter. I mean that with my soul, I love your daughter, and intend to make her queen of England. Well then, who dost thou mean shall be her king? Even he that makes her queen, who else should be? What, thou? Even so, how think you of it? How canst thou woo her? That would I learn from you, as one being best acquainted with her humor. And wilt thou learn of me? Madam, with all my heart. Send to her, by the man that slew her brothers, a pair of bleeding hearts. Thereon engrave Edward and York, then haply will she weep. If this induce her not to love, send her a letter of thy noble deeds. Tell her thou madest to wear her uncle Clarence, her uncle Rivers, I, and for her sake, madest quick conveyance with her good Aunt Anne. You mock me, madam. This is not the way to win your daughter. There is no other way, unless thou couldst put on some other shape and not be Richard that have done all this. Look, what is done cannot now be amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes. Tell her the king that make command and treat. That at her hands which the king's king forbid. Say I shall make her a high and mighty queen. To wail the title as her mother doth. Say she shall live everlastingly. But how long shall that title ever last? Sweetly in force unto her fair life's end. But how long fairly shall her sweet life last? As long as heaven and nature lengthens it. As long as hell and Richard likes of it. Be eloquent in my behalf to her. An honest tale speeds best being plainly told. Then plainly to her tell my loving tale. Plain and not honest is too harsh a style. Your reasons are too shallow and too quick. My reasons are too deep and dead. 
deep and dead poor infants in their graves. Harp not on that string, madam, that is past. But it still shall I till heartstrings break. Now by my George, my garter, and my crown. Profane, dishonored, and the third you search. I swear. By nothing, for this is no oath. If something thou would swear to be believed, then swear by something that thou hast not wrong. Then by myself. Thyself is self-misused. Now by the world. Tis full of thy foul wrong. Well then, by God. God's wrong is worst of all. If thou hast feared to break an oath with him, the unity the king my husband made, thou hadst not broken, No, my brothers died. What canst thou swear by now? The time to come. Swear not by time to come. That thou hast misused ere used. As I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my bloody affairs, be opposite all planets of good luck to my proceedings, if with dear heart's love, immaculate devotion, holy thoughts, I tender not thy beauteous princely daughter. In her consists my happiness and thine, without her follows to myself and thee, herself, the land, and many a Christian soul, death, desolation, ruin, and decay. It cannot be avoided but by this. It will not be avoided but by this. Therefore, good mother, I must call you so. Be the attorney of my love to her. Plead what I will be, not what I have been, not my deserts, but what I will deserve. Urge the necessity and state of times, and be not peevish fond in great design. Yet thou didst kill my children. But in your daughter's womb, I bury them, where, in that nest of spicery, they will breed selves of themselves to your recomfiture. Shall I go in my daughter to thy will? And be a happy mother by the deed. Write to me shortly, and you shall understand from me for mine. Bear to her my true love's kiss. And so farewell. Relenting fool and shallow changing woman. How now? What's the news? Most mighty sovereign, on the western coast ride of the puissant navy, to our shores throng many doubtful, hollow-hearted friends, unarmed and unresolved to beat them back. Tis thought that Richmond is their admiral, and there they haul, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. Some light-foot friend, post to the Duke of Norfolk. Ratcliffe, you, oh, Catesby, where is he? Oh, here, my good lord. Catesby, fly to the Duke. Ratcliffe. Ah, well, it must be haste. Come hither. Post you to Salisbury. Dull, unmindful villain, why stayest thou here and not goest to the duke? First, mighty least, tell me your highness's pleasure. What's from your grace shall I deliver to him? Oh, true, good Gatesby. Uh, Bid him levy straight the greatest strength and power he can muster, and meet me suddenly at Salisbury. Aye, I will go. Stanley, what's the news? Richmond is on the sea. There, let him sink, and the seas be on him. White-livered renegade, what doth he there? Oh, most mighty sovereign, I cannot, I cannot ever guess. <laughs> well, as you guess. Stirred up by Dorset, Buckingham and Ely, he makes for England, here to claim the crown. Is the chair empty? Is the sword unswayed? Is the king dead, the empire unpossessed? What great York of air is there alive but we? And who is England's king, if not Great York's heir? Then tell me, what makes he upon the seas? Unless for that, my liege, I cannot guess. Unless for that, he comes to be your liege. You cannot guess wherefore the Welshman comes. You will fly to Richmond. You will revolt, I fear. <laughs> no, my good lord, therefore mistrust me not. Where is your power, then? 
to beat them back. Where be thy tenants and thy followers? If not now on the northern shore, safe conducting the rebels in their ships. No, my good lord. My friends are in the north. The north. Cold friends to me. What do they there when they should be in the west serving their sovereign? They have not been commanded by the king. Pleaseth your majesty to give me leave. I'll muster up my friends and meet your grace, where and at what time your majesty shall please. Aye, aye, you will run to Richmond, but I'll not trust thee. Most mighty sovereign, you have no cause to hold my friendship doubtful. I never was, nor never will be false. Go then and muster men. But leave behind your son, George Stanley, and look your heart be firm or his head's assurance is but frail. Oh, then deal with him, as I prove true to you. <clears throat> the news I have to tell your majesty is that by sudden flood and fall of water, Buckingham's army is dispersed and scattered, and he himself wandered away alone. No man knows whither. Have any well-advised friend proclaimed reward to him that brings the traitor in? Such proclamation hath been made, my lord. But this good comfort bring I to your highness. The Breton navy is dispersed by tempest. Richmond and Dorchester sent out a boat into the shore to ask those on the banks, were they his assistants, yea or no? Who answered him? They came from Buckingham upon his party. He mistrusting them, hoist sail and made course again for Bretagne. March on, march on, since we are up in arms, if not to fight foreign enemies, then to beat down these rebels here at home. My liege, my liege. The Duke of Buckingham is taken. That is the best news. That the Earl of Richmond is with a mighty force. Landed at Milford is much colder tidings that must be told. Away to Salisbury. Someone take message to have Buckingham brought to Salisbury. The rest of you, come with me. Richmond this for me, that in the sty of this most deadly bore, my son, young George Stanley, lies franked up in hold. If I revolt, off goes young George's head, and, and the fear of this holds off my present age. But, but tell me, where is princely Richmond now? At Pembroke, or at Hartford West in Wales. A and what men of note resort to him? Sir Walter Herbert, a renowned insult. Gilbert Talbot, Sir William Stanley, Oxford, redoubted Pembroke, Sir James Blunt, and many others of great name and worth. And towards London do they bend their power, if, by the way, they be not bought with all. Well, hie thee to thy lord. Commend me to him. Tell him that the queen hath hardly endorsed that he should espouse Elizabeth, her daughter. My letter will resolve him of my mind. Farewell. King Richard, let me speak with him. No, my good lord. Therefore, be patient. Hastings and Edward's children, Gray and Rivers, Vaughan, and all that have miscarried by underhand, corrupted, foul injustice, if that your moody, discontented souls do through the clouds behold this present hour, even for revenge <coughs> mock my destruction. This is all Souls Day, fellow, is it not? It is. Why then, all Souls Day is my body's doomsday. This is the day which, in King Edward's time, I wished might fall on me when I proved false to his children and his wife's allies. This is the day wherein I wished to fall by the false faith of him whom most I trusted. Thus Margaret's curse falls heavy on my neck when he, quoth she, shall split thy heart with sorrow, remember Margaret was a prophetess. Come, lead me, officers, to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame the due of blame.
Bellows in arms, and my most loving friends, bruised underneath the yoke of tyranny thus far into the bowels of the land, have we marched on without impediment. And here receive we from our father Stanley lines of fair comfort and encouragement. The wretched, bloody, and usurping boar lies now even into the sentry of the isle, near unto Leicester as we learn. In God's name, cheerly on, courageous friends, to reap the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war. Every man's conscience is a thousand swords to fight against this guilty homicide. I doubt not but his friends will turn to us. He hath no friends but what are friends for fear, which in his dearest need will fly from him. In God's name, march. True hope is swift and flies on swallows' wings. Kings it makes gods, and meaner creatures kings. Here pitch our tent, even here in Bosworth Field. Why, how now capes me? Why look you so sad? My heart is ten times lighter than my looks. My lord of Norfolk. Here, most graciously. Norfolk, we must have knocks. Ha! Must we not? We must both give and take, my loving lord. Up with the tent. Here will I sleep tonight. But where tomorrow? Aye, one's all for that. Who hath described the number of the traitors? Six or seven thousand is their utmost power. Why, our battalion trebles that account. Besides, the king's name is a tower of strength, which they on the adverse faction want. Up with the tent. Come, gentlemen, let us survey the vantage of the ground. Call for some men of sound direction. Let's lack no discipline. Make no delay, for lords, tomorrow is a busy day. The weary sun hath made a golden set, and by the bright track of his fiery car gives token of a goodly day tomorrow. Sir William Brandon, you shall bear my standard. The Earl of Pembroke keeps his regiment. Good Captain Blunt, bear my good night to him, and by the second hour in the morning, desire the Earl to see me in my tent. One thing more could Captain do for me. Where is Lord Stanley quartered, do you know? His regiment lies a half a mile at least south from the mighty power of the king. If without peril it be possible, sweet Blunt, make you some good means to speak with him, and give him from me this most needful note. Upon my life, my lord, I'll undertake it. So God give you quiet rest tonight. Good night, good Captain Blunt. Come, gentlemen, give me ink and paper in my tent. I'll draw the form and model of our battle. Limit each leader to his several charge and part in just proportion our small power. Let us consult upon tomorrow's business. Come, into my tent. The dew is raw and cold. Supper time, my lord, uh, nine o'clock. I will not sup tonight. Give me some ink and paper and all my armor laid into my tent. Uh, it is all laid in readiness, my lord. Catesby. I am my good lord. Send a messenger to Stanley's regiment. Bid him bring his power before sunrising, lest his son's head fall into the blind cave of eternal night. Ratcliffe, my lord, give me some wine. I do not have that alacrity of spirit nor cheer of mind I was wont to have. Leave me. Bid my guard watch. About mid of night, Radcliffe, come to my tent and help arm me. Leave, I say! Fortune and victory, sit on thy helm. All comfort the dark night can afford be to thy person, noble father-in-law. Tell me, how fares our loving mother? I by attorney bless thee from thy mother, who prays continually for Richmond's good. Now in brief, for so the season bids us be, prepare thy battle early in the morning. I as I may, 
with best advantage will deceive the time and aid thee as this doubtful shock of arms. But on thy side I may not be too forward, lest being seen thy brother tender George be executed in his father's sight. Farewell. God give us leisure for these rites of love. Once more, adieu, be valiant, speed well. My good lords and gentlemen, conduct him to his regiment. I'll strive with troubled thoughts to take a nap, lest tomorrow leaden slumber pees me down when I should mount with wings of victory. Once more, good night, good lords and gentlemen. O thou, whose captain I account myself, Look on my forces with a gracious eye. Make us thy ministers of chastisement, that we may praise thee in the victory. Sleeping and waking, oh, defend me still. Let me sit heavy on thy chest tomorrow, I that was washed to death with fulsome wine. Poor Clare, by thy guile betrayed to death. Tomorrow in the battle think on me and let fall thy edgeless sword. Despair and die. Offspring of the house of Lancaster, the wronged heirs of York do pray for thee. Good angels guard thy battle, live and flourish. Think on thy nephews, smothered in the tower. Let us be led in thy bosom, and weigh thee down to shame, despair, and death. Thy nephews bid thee despair and die. Sleep, Richmond. Sleep in peace and wake in joy. Let angels guard thee from the poor of Illinois. Live, and beget a happy race of kings. Edwards and happy sons do bid thee flourish. Bloody and guilty, guiltily awake, and in a bloody battle end thy days. Think on Lord Hastings, and despair, and die. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Quiet, untroubled soul, awake, awake. Arm, fight, and conquer for fair England's sake. Richard, thy wife, that wretched and thy wife, oh. that never slept a quiet hour with Ooh. thee, now fills thy sleep with perturbation. Tomorrow in the battle think on me, and fall thy edgeless sword. Ooh. Despair and die. Ooh. Thou quiet soul, sleep thou a quiet sleep. Dream of success and happy victory. Thy adversary's wife doth pray for thee. The first was I that helped thee to the crown. The last was I that felt thy tyranny. Oh, in the battle, think on Buckingham and die in terror of thy guiltiness. Dream on, dream on of bloody deeds and death, fainting despair, despairing, yield thy breath. I died for hope ere I could lend thee aid, but cheer thy heart and be thou not dismayed. God and good angels fight on Richmond's side, and Richard falls in height of all his pride. Give me another horse! Bind up my wounds! Have mercy, Jesu! So, I did but dream. Oh, coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me! The light burns blue, and it is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several 
tale and every tale condemns me for a villain. I shall despair. There's no creature loves me. And if I die, no soul will pity me. Nay, wherefore should they? Since that I myself can find in myself no pity to myself. Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. My lord. Swans, who is there? My lord, tis I. The early village cock hath twice made salutation to the morn. Your friends are up and buckle on their armor. Radical. I have dreamed a fearful dream. What thinkst thou? Will all our friends prove true? No doubt, my lord. Radical. I fear. I fear. Nay, good my lord. Be not afraid of shadows. <laughs> oh, by the apostle Paul, shadows tonight have cast more terror into the soul of Richard than then can the substance of 10,000 soldiers armored in proof and led by shallow rich. It is not yet near day. Come, go with me. Good morrow, Richmond. Oh, cry mercy, lords and watchful gentlemen, that you obtain such a tardy sluggard here. How'd you sup, my lord? Oh, the sweetest sleep and fairest boding dreams that ever entered into a drowsy head have I since your departure had, my lords. But methoughts their souls, whose bodies Richard murdered, came to my tent and cried on victory. I promise you, my soul is very jocund in the remembrance of so fair a dream. But tell me, how far into morning is it? Upon the stroke of four. Why, then tis time to arm and give direction. Much that I could say, loving countrymen, the leisure and enforcement of the time forbids to dwell on. And yet, remember this. God and our good cause fight upon our side. Richard except, those whom we fight against had rather have us win than him they follow. For what is he they follow? Truly, friends, a bloody tyrant and a homicide. A base, foul stone made precious by the foil of England's chair, where he is falsely set, one that hath ever been God's enemy. Then if you will fight against God's enemy, God will in justice ward you as his soldiers. Advance your standards, draw your willing swords. For me, the ransom of this bold attempt shall be my cold corpse on the earth's cold face. But if I thrive, the gain of my attempt, the least of you shall share his part thereof. Sound drums and trumpets, bold and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and victory! Who saw the sun today? Not I, my lord. Then he disdains to shine, for by the book he should have braved the east an hour ago. A black day will it be to some. Radcliffe, my lord, the sun will not be seen today. The sky doth frown and hour upon our army. Not shine today. Why, what should that mean to me more than to Richmond? The selfsame heaven that frowns on me looks sadly on him. Arm, arm, my lord, the foe bones in the field. Come, bustle, bustle, caparison my horse. Send word to Stanley, bid him bring his power. I will lead my soldiers to the plain, and thus shall my battle be ordered. My forward shall be drawn out all in length, consisting equally of horse and foot, our archers placed strongly in the midst. John, Duke of Norfolk, and Thomas, Earl of Surrey, shall have the leading of this multitude, and we ourselves will follow in the main battle. Norfolk, what think you? A good direction, warlike sovereign. Come, gentlemen, let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. Hark, 
I hear their drum. Fight, gentlemen of England, fight, bold yeomen! What news from Stanley? My lord, he thought the night had come. Off with George's head! My lord, the enemy has passed the marsh after the battle that George Stanley died. A thousand hearts are great within my bosom. Advance our standards, set upon our foes. Our ancient word of courage, fair St. George, inspire us with the spleen of fiery dragons. Upon them, victory is at our helms! to every danger, his horse is slain, and all on foot he fights, seeking for Richmond in the throat of death. Rescue my fair lord, or the day is lost. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Draw, my lord, I'll help you to a horse. Slave, I have set my life against the cast, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five of us slain today instead of him. A horse. A horse! My kingdom for a horse! Richard! Richmond, well hast thou acquit thee. Lo, here this long usurped royalty, from the dead temples of this bloody wretch have I plucked off, to grace thy brows withal. Wear it, enjoy it, <laughs> make much of it. Great God of all, say amen. But tell me, young George Stanley, is he living? He is, my lord, and safe in Lister Town. Whither if it please you, we may now withdraw us. What men of name on either side are slain? Well, John, Duke of Norfolk, Robert Brackenberry, Walter Lord Ferrers, and Sir William Brand. Inter their bodies as becomes their words. Proclaim a pardon to those soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. Then, as we obtain the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile, heaven, upon our fair conjunction that hath ever frowned upon their enmity. England hath long been mad and scarred herself. All that divided York and Lancaster united in their dire division. Oh, now, let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, conjoin together, and let their heirs, God, if his will be so, enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace smiling plenty, and fair, prosperous days. Civil wounds are stopped. Peace lives again. That she may long live here. God say amen. Amen. <laughs> 